Hello everyone, doing something new, something different. This is kind of a one of a thing deal. Uh, this is not going to be a ministry video. I'm going to be discussing my time in jury duty. Now, just to be a warning, even though I'm saying this is not a ministry video, I might speak on spiritual matters in this video, but that won't be the main focus. Just so you're aware of that. Alright, so let's get going. This is, once again, this is going to be a video, probably 20 minutes, about my time in jury duty. Now, I've, for many years, I have desired to participate in jury duty, um, but never have. Now, I think this is the third time that I've been called to be available for jury duty, but this is the first time I actually had to show up. Um, I've always had interest in justice and judgment and these kinds of things, and this does manifest in my spiritual walk with the Lord and my desire for judgment and those kinds of things. But this week has been has been intense. I had a family member die, and so this wasn't necessarily a time I wanted to do it. Uh, my funeral was on Friday. I'm recording this on Saturday. You'll be probably getting this. It'll probably be published on Sunday. Jury was one day only the previous week, this week. Although, again, when you watch this, it will be the previous week. Uh, I will not name names. I will not name the court. Well, one thing is I'm terrible at remembering names, okay? But the most important reason I don't want to, even though I can legally discuss these things, uh, because the court case is over, I don't wish to name names, okay? Um, so my concern was, was I going to be in jury stuck through Friday and miss uh, the funeral, which I did not want to do. But I also wanted to be made available because I wanted to participate. And again, this is the week I wanted to do it because, you know, I had a funeral and other things were on my mind. And I didn't want to be distracted with those things as well uh, when... I, if, I, if I have to do jury duty. So I was kind of wiffle waffling on whether I should uh, let the court know and those kinds of things. Well, I showed up. I think there was about 30, 35 of us. And supposedly I've been told that there were others who signed up late when getting in, but there was a whole bunch, maybe like 20% more that didn't show up. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. So I had to show up at the courthouse at 8.30. Again, priority in my mind was to let them know I would not be available on Friday. That was going to be my final stance. But I would continue to participate in any measure until that day. So every, every night before the previous day, I always had to call in to see if I had duties the, previous, the next day. And I've been doing that. So they explain that we're in this room below the court and we're waiting for a phone call to, to go up to the courtroom where the jurors would be selected. And they went through some of the procedures and that they're going to ask us questions and that we have to hear. And if we have any questions, make sure you ask them before they read through the whole legal rigmarole. Because if you stop and ask questions then, then they have to start all over again. So um, they told us about that. And then we went up to the courtroom. They told us, you know, uh, some of us would be called into the jury box. And they would question us about whether we were fit for jury duty or not. And then the lawyers would have opportunity, I think, I could be wrong, 
I'm trying to give this detail as soon as possible. This is only a few days after the event, so I might have a few things wrong. That each lawyer could do, remove three or four jurors um, to be replaced. Because there was plenty of us there. Let me see, he's 9, 18. No, I, I take that back. I said 30. I think there was about 60 of them there. So I think they had, they, they called off names. And we went to the juror box. And I think, again, it was, no, let's see, 6, 12, 18. No, you know, it was like 30, 35, something like that. Maybe, maybe a few more. Uh, so they called in 6, 12, 18. 18 to like 22 something like that up into the juror box and started questioning us on our ability to be jurors and i had to been told you know a lot of people would disqualify themselves I, that, that did not happen at all um the judge asked some questions a few people did raise their hands uh, there was one who had a relative who was a police officer, but somewhere else, I don't remember where. Uh, there was one lady who was training to be a lawyer and was working with defense lawyers somewhere else. But again, uh, not working with any of them, although the, I think she knew... Um, some of the defense of the the lawyers who were participating in the state's defense state's arguments because this was a civil trial okay this was um the state versus the accused we'll talk about that in a moment um but the judge did not take any of these people out of the court for jury duty. Now, as you can see, it is slippery here. I'm being very careful. I was like, um, I'm not going to bring my ice um, grips for my boots. I should have. I should have. So then the lawyers from both sides took a bunch of us out. I, again, I think it was like somewhere between six to eight they pulled out. But that left enough. They never had to refill the jury selection um, from the removal of those that were taken. And they definitely did take uh, the one who had connections to lawyers. She was booted out. And I think the one that was, I'm not sure, but I think the one who had a um, connection to a police officer, he was taken as well. I did note that I think some people were removed, which is interesting, uh, based upon their age and uh, based upon, I believe, their race. They're probably trying to have a jury that would, they think would help them on whatever side they were promoting. All right, so let's get to the case. The case was one man kicked another man's face in. This man's face was severely damaged. He had a, a broken nose. Um, he had his teeth, jaw, wired clothes, face, bones broken. Matter of fact, he had to be replaced. I don't know if it was through metal or plastic. I don't remember that. And in fact, both sides uh, agreed that these damages were real. None of that was in question, and it was given as evidence that they both both sides agreed that the damage was real. Um, the facts surrounding the case. Well, there are some facts that we know true. Everybody agreed. There was a social engagement at this woman's duplex after some or all of them not sure on that were at bar at a bar different bars not all at the same bar 
there were three men and one woman. The woman was the one who had this place that the incident occurred at. The victim, we'll call him the victim, who the state was representing, again, this was not a civil case, this was a criminal case. He was to come forward to the stand. Now, I'm gonna say now we had written statements that were taken by the police, and we had their testimony in court. One of the men who was there, his name was, oh, sorry. I edit, I'm going to edit that name out. One man who was there, we never got any testimony of him, which was a big struggle to me and some of the others that were in the jury. Most of what I'm going to share is going to be a mixture of their written testimony and their present testimony in the court. And I'm going to guarantee you I'm not going to remember which is which of what sources there were. So forgive me for not remembering if some of what I say is from written or from oral. So the gentleman who was hurt was first. He tells us that he was at a bar, had one drink, but it was a very big drink. And he got a text from his female friend saying, you can come over, we're gonna have an after bar party. At this point, he, uh, he agrees and he goes to her place. He says that the garage door was open, you know, the big garage door open. He walks in and he sees this other male who he does not know confronting the girl who lives there, his female friend. Again, just friends, nothing more. That's what we're told. He confronts this guy saying, what's going on? And you know, that kind of thing confronts him who is arguing against this woman to this woman and she's like up against the wall this is what he says okay he turns around the one who's arguing with the girl to the guy who walks into the garage who got the text to come to the party and they begin a verbal confrontation and some pushing was involved and it got broken up and then they step into the driveway and it got worse and there was wrestling involved they were on the ground again forgive me if i get some small details wrong so far i haven't seen any i didn't look yesterday i've not seen any news articles on this whether it makes the news or not i don't know then the guy who came to the to the party he says he tripped on his own feet and fell to the ground and the other guy who we saw there and was arguing with the girl uh, came over to him while he was trying to get himself up and kicked him in the face now, I don't remember exactly what his story was on this and these some of these next details by the way most of what i remember from his story is was his oral statement i don't remember a lot of his written statement so i think most of what i just shared was his oral statement at this point um the guy who kicked him i think was asked to leave according to the guy who was injured's account he uh went to his house which is only seven houses away so that's he was close to this woman and thus knew her and had supposedly been at her house a few times again they were friends and um, she came and the third gentleman came and they cleaned him up and found that his injuries were worse 
than what it seemed like after being cleaned up. She offered to call him an Uber to the hospital and he took it. That's going to end that story. Obviously the police came to him, by the way, the next morning, that, that, cause that, that happened like at, he arrived around 12.30. He, I think, ended up at the hospital by 1.30, somewhere around there, 1.32 in the morning. And the police showed up at six in the morning, so like four hours later. So his written testimony was very, very re recent to the events. Now the woman's testimony. We have a written testimony taken by the police, I believe one or two, one and a half or two days later, and her testimony in court. She, in court, did not remember many of the details. And she was crying through her testimony. And she seemed very neutral, neither for either side, either the two men involved. And she started giving us information that was contrary to the gentleman's story we just heard in some details. Um, most of what I took, and I'll explain that in a bit, was from her written testimony. Um, at this point, I think to make the story stronger, I'm going to not speak on her testimony of these incidents. But just to let you know, um, she had much memory loss of the incident and some of what she had to say written and, which was the written testament story was read to us in court, as well as her oral story. But I also wanna say, I'm gonna backtrack. When I went to the court that day, I was very, very nervous. A lot of butterflies in my stomach even during the process of selection and just sitting there and waiting. And while we were waiting to go up to be chosen, um, the bailiff got a call sending us up and he said, this is the earliest we've ever been called up to court. That was interesting. And we got, while in court, we got sent to the jury room. This is, you know, after the, the process started sent to the jury room three times maybe four and um i'll tell about one of those in a bit and one incident the bailiff said was very rare it obviously had happened before but he said it was very rare so this is very slippery and i'm going to uh pause while i get past this all right back to the case so when the gentleman who was hurt his story was given. I, he seemed a, a trustworthy guy. I had no problem with his story, no problem with his character. Uh, he seemed to have all his ducks in a row. But when she started speaking to us and when her story was read to us, her written testimony, things changed. Things, it, it, again, I've never done any of this, and I don't see a lot of court dramas, but this was like very unreal to me. It was like I was watching TV, but it was happening real life in front of me because what she said did not align with what he said, the first one. And, it, and the lawyer who represented the state said this was going to be a simple case. And it wasn't simple, at least not to me, okay? Let's get to the accused statement. He was sitting in the courtroom the whole time and next to his lawyer. By, by the way, by the way, the first for the first guy who talked, the man who was injured, he was asked, do you see the person who hurt you in the courtroom? Do you recognize him? And he said, no. 
he said multiple times he does not know who it was who hurt him and does not recognize him in the courtroom but he was there okay sitting right next to the lawyer but he did not recognize him okay and that, and he said several times he did not know this person never met him before never had any confrontations with him before anything like that okay so now we get to the accused and he tells us a third story he says um by the way he was an rn and he just left a foreign country to help these people in another country get medical treatment kind of give him uh some positive character uh vibes you know what i'm saying so he says he did know the person who was injured he knew him by reputation but he had never met him but he did have a confrontation with him on the phone the person who was kicked was on a phone call with the girl and he was at the girl's house he i think he claimed to be her boyfriend or had some romantic interest there um, I think the girl claimed that um, the first guy the guy who did get hurt was just a friend but he had romantic interest but nothing nothing happened there and if I remember correctly she did admit I can't remember of having romantic relationship with the other guy or at least the other guy was pursuing it. I can't remember the details on that, okay? So the guy who kicked the other guy, he says he was, he was at her house when she got a call from the first guy. But it wasn't a regular phone call. It was through Facebook Messenger, but it was audio only. I'm getting warm, excuse me, as I adjust my clothing. All right, let's get back. Or right, this is gonna be slippery here. I just have to be careful. So they had this Facebook Messenger conversation. I don't remember who initiated the call, but the guy who got kicked was talking to the girl on the cell phone. Obviously, it's gotta be a cell phone to do a Facebook Messenger. And then somehow the conversation went from the guy to the girl, the guy who had been kicked, to the guy who got kicked, to the guy who kicked him. But again, this was a week prior to the incident. And they got into ver verbal um, hostilities on the phone. We're not told what those were. And I have to, uh, here I'm, gonna, I'm going to backtrack and say that when the woman gave her testimony, she did say that when the first guy showed up, um, she was not in some kind of verbal argument with the other guy. And also, I'm fairly certain she said that, but she did say it with certainty, he came with hostility. The guy who got kicked came to her home with hostility and she does not remember how he got there she could not confirm or deny that she sent a text to invite him okay all right so let's go back to the testimony of the gentleman who kicked the other man so he says yes he knew the other guy by reputation and had a confrontation with him on the phone he says that they got into he that this guy showed up very angry and hostile to him saying um calling him names and these kinds of things and uh they got into an argument and it became um hostile that was pushing and um 
wrestling. I think this. I think he said this happened, uh, and it moved to the driveway. He's. I think he says. I can't remember if it's from him, or for her, or from her, or for both. She, in her written testimony, states that he came into the house because she went into the house while the other guy w was uh, on the ground, but she didn't know he was on the ground. She went in while they were verbally uh, arguing. The guy who kicked him claims he went into the house also and then came back outside and the other guy was on the ground. So he goes outside and he stands by him and he says the guy who was on the ground again, the guy who was kicked, gets up and he gets himself into a like a football crouching pose and looked like he was going to charge him. He starts backing up, actually he starts stepping away, but uh, one or two steps. Uh, but then he decides it would not be wise for him to have his back to this gentleman that was on the ground again, who was kicked, but hasn't happened yet, okay. Because he felt it was too dangerous to keep his back to him, so he turned around. And he says at this point, he's in, he's in that football crouch, and he takes one or two steps to attack him. In defense, he kicks him. He says he does not remember or did not know where he kicked him. He was kicked in the face. He says this is at night now, okay? So they're claiming it's too dark. He couldn't see where he kicked him. Okay, I'm trying to remember exactly what was stated. He also says the other guy hit him first, doesn't know which body part touched him, and he doesn't remember where he touched him, but did said he took one or two steps and charged him. Okay. At this point, he says he decided to leave, I think on his own accord, and left the scene. Now, in her written statement, I think it's her written statement, she said she asked him to leave. So this is what we go we we go into we go into we get we, we get the final uh, statement by the by the judges I mean by the attorneys and we go and we go to deliberate at this point we all agree that the two both two guys their statements are so opposite of each other and she only agrees with some of both stories. Obviously, to us, this was a fight for the girl. It seemed to us, after thinking and seeing all these things through, that the first guy came there with hostilities in mind. Well, I, sorry. These are some of the conclusions that I came up with and we discussed later. But, before those conclusions, we, we go into the jury room to make our decision. I'm fairly certain eight of the 12 of us, within seconds of sitting down, were ready to say guilty. Um, I said, I said they, they wanted to take their, their, take their vote in the room. I said, we can do that, but I'm telling you right now, I am not fully persuaded. I said, I need to read her written statement. Because at that point, I believe the guy was guilty of kicking this guy, okay? I was fairly certain he was guilty and was not defending himself. But, because of all the crazy testimonies and the confliction between all of them, I wanted to read her written statement because she did not remember things very well. And then there were four of us. They, we, I said, you can go ahead and take that vote, but I'm not ready. So we did. Eight of them said he was guilty, four did not. I said, before, before you stop there, maybe some of these other three 
think uh, he's not guilty. So I said, by the way, I was not <laughs> the jury lead. Let's talk a little bit about that. There was one juror who had prior jury experience. He was uh, a, a previously he was he was a teacher, but he was retired. I thought he might be the jury lead, but no. One of the jurors, I think, had uh, his job was in, in insurance, and he dealt with the court in his job frequently. He says, if nobody wants to be the jury lead, I forget what the name title of that is, I will be. By the way, all jurors have equal authority. This guy just represents the jury, okay? Um, so we all agreed. I didn't want it. Has anybody else, anybody else wanted it? No, I didn't want it because it was my first time, and I was super nervous. But again, things went from nervous to intense and unreal to me uh, by the time we were in the middle of the court. So, but obviously I took a strong role in the courtroom. So we took, they took the vote. Nobody said he was not guilty. So me and three others were just undecided. So I said, I need to get, because the, they didn't give us any of the exhibits, the evidence. And we had to request it. And I said, I want to see her written testimony. So... Others say, well, why don't we just ask for all of it? <laughs> so we did, and uh, the bailiff did tell us ahead of time that sometimes the judge doesn't want to do so unless he wants to contact the lawyers first. But no, he said, go ahead, you can have it all. So I think we got it within, I don't know, 20 minutes, something like that. So I get it, I read it, and I'm, I'm persuaded right away because in her written statement it says he was on the ground when the guy came over he was getting up starting to get up when he got kicked so at that point i have two wits two testimonies of him being on the ground and starting to get up when he was kicked and only the guy who did the kicking disagreed with that point that was the most important point because everybody had questions that were not answered well where was the testimony of the third gentleman we didn't have it um, sadly she couldn't remember many things in court but we had her written statement by the police signed by her Agreed, agreed to by her and she had opportunity to change it that was brought in the courtroom they all had opportunity to change their statement by contacting the police and changing it afterwards none of them did that none so i said me reading this here that she, he was on the ground and she saw this although she didn't see where he kicked him but she saw him kicking but saw the damage to his face afterwards. So again, we also knew everybody agreed if we had evidence that he was damaged in the face. So it's not, there was no doubt that he got kicked. Well, there was no doubt that he had damage and there was little doubt he got kicked. They all agreed he got kicked. Um, they all didn't agree how he got kicked, but there we saw a second testimony of her saying he we saw him kick she saw him kick him when he was on the ground and getting up not in a crouching stance but on the ground and getting up maybe an arm maybe an elbow we don't know, know all those details but he was on the ground getting up this persuaded me and the next 10 minutes 20 minutes maybe 30 minutes at the most two others we all agreed, we took a vote, 11, us, 11 of us believed he was guilty. The 12th juror was 95% convinced. He, like me and a few others, believed in self-defense. And his problem was twofold. One, this was a serious situation and he felt it would weigh up on him afterwards and we shouldn't make a quick judgment. I agreed, that's why I, didn't, that's why I didn't vote guilty right away. 
The second thing is, he was severely concerned that if he ever had to defend himself, he didn't want to have to be in court like this situation where he harmed somebody defending himself. And that, that's a problem in America, right? A lot of places, you're not allowed to defend yourself or with severe restrictions. Now, some of the people who were quick to say guilty thought the amount of damage done to the gentleman made the other gentleman guilty because the amount of damage. I didn't consider that as a response to guilty or not guilty at all. And clearly this other gentleman didn't and maybe one or two others. So we had to, because he had a lot of questions that we didn't have answers to. And one thing that bothered him in her written statement, it said that he was in the house and came outside. And if that were true, he's like, well, if he was inside, he had opportunity to leave and he wasn't in duress. He could have just left, went out a different door, left, whatever. So he didn't know if he should believe her account on that. Um, or trust the kicker's account, okay? But again, I don't remember if he said he was in the house or not. That I don't remember, okay? So we had, it took us two hours to get, to get him to make a, a decision. And none of us forced him. We just had to keep talking about the situation. And I said, and I kept, I was sitting right next to this guy. And finally near the end, I'm like, you have to choose who to believe. The judge told us at the very beginning of the trial you, that we're gonna hear stories and testimonies that are gonna conflict. Who are you going to believe? And we, we spent, a lot of us spent time talking about that this girl didn't have a stance for either one of the guys, okay? In some places, it appeared that he, she, she asked him to leave, the guy who did the kicking. We also have testimony of her going to the guy who got injured to his house, cleaning him up. But again, she said that the guy who got kicked came to the place in hostilities, hostile. So there seemed, and, and, I, and I was pushing this to give him an understanding of what we have to trust someone. And she didn't seem like she was taking sides at all. Yes, she helped the guy who was kicked, but she also said he came hostile. I said, it really doesn't matter to me whether he was in or out. But if you're looking at her testimony saying that that, that guy was in the house, then you can go ahead and probably believe that statement because it was in the written statement. It was not written. I don't remember if it was in her verbal statement. We all agreed that we could not trust her verbal statement. So eventually, because uh, the bailiff would come in, uh, it was around five o'clock. Guys, uh, we're gonna order you some pizza. And we were at that point, that at that point, for probably the previous half hour already, or no, oh, actually probably an hour and a half, sorry. Uh, I think around, I'm guessing, I don't remember, I'm guessing somewhere around 3.30, 11 of us were ready to, to say guilty. So we've been debating an hour and a half at this point. And we said, no, don't get us pizza. Although I didn't mind. We were so close that we just didn't want to delay this any further. The judge did give us the possibility of going into the next day, which by the way was Thursday. That's why I, I didn't say anything because it was given up. They gave us two days to get take care of this, Wednesday and Thursday, okay? So that's why I, I didn't bring up, except to the bailiff, uh, that I didn't want to be there Friday. 
but the judge told us when when uh, choosing the jurors to you have to be available these two days so that's why I stuck with it and didn't bring it up any further so here we are at five o'clock and the the judge wanted to give us um, like an hour break and we were we were like close to having this solved and the lead juror says just give us a few minutes he said five but it took about 20 minutes and uh, I would say 520 to 530 the final juror agreed but um, he he just wasn't as happy none of us were happy because we had a lot of questions a lot of questions but wouldn't get answered we all agreed that the guy who got kicked was the aggressor at the beginning that's what we believe but we can't punish him there were there were two there were two um, things we had to decide one I think is called assault and battery okay and the second was um, what they call it You're making loud noises uh, cursing in public public nuisance that was the other one I would have loved to put the public nuisance on the other guy but we were not charged with that that was not the case the case was on the other guy okay we we agreed that this is probably what happened he the guy who got kicked more than likely had strong interest in having a relationship with a girl this is evidenced what we believe by this phone call and thus when he showed up there he went to him to confront him to get him out of there because he wanted to get to the girl and the other guy was in the way he caused the situation however the other guy who caused the damage we agreed and we believe he had opportunity to leave despite their both interest in getting to the girl he could have left but he didn't and we found him guilty so that is the story of my my jury duty uh, and it ended uh, if I don't know what his punishment was they they released the jury so I don't know if he's going into prison if he has to go to jail if he has to pay a fine I don't know that is the case that I had to participate in in jury duty this week hopefully that interests you um, spiritual implications I believe we're getting to the point where God is going to be judging the earth is this happening very soon is this a <laughs> uh, thing that God did allow me to participate in to promote the signs of the times I don't know but uh, I believe my life is ordained by God led by God while I pursue him am I pursuing him at this time I believe I am pursuing him at this time so I believe it was God's will for me to be there in jury duty um, we had to make a lot of assumptions uh, but we had to and I tried to do it with wisdom that God has given me I didn't want to do it quickly I wanted to read that testimony that she she signed and gave two days after the event when it was real when it was near to the event uh, I thought it was unwise to be to claim him guilty when there so quickly when there were testimonies that contradicted each other but we had to go with what we had and we didn't have a lot and it was for me it was two against one on the point that he got kicked when he was on the ground when he was defenseless and not a threat and most of us agreed with that again some of them thought he was guilty because of the amount of damage that was done but I think everybody agreed that the point that he was on the ground showed that it was not an act of self-defense but of aggression even though he didn't start the aggression he finished the aggression when he could have left all right that's my story hopefully you enjoyed it you can make comments below ask me questions I'm not gonna give any any names and I'm not gonna say what court it happened at 
God bless, folks. We'll see you again some other time soon. This is probably more than 20 minutes after this point. Sorry. Hope you enjoyed it, though. Bye-bye.